Patrick Trano, University of Illinois, Department of Crop Sciences at Urbana-Champaign. And so I'm going to tell you a story um, about some research that we did, which led us to the conclusion that mixing is more important. And, and the neat part about this conclusion is that it was reached from real data from real farms. So it wasn't just a, an experiment we dreamed up in the lab or in the greenhouse and put out in the field. So let's start with a definition of herbicide resistance. What is it? Well, there's multiple definitions out there, and I'm sure you guys all have your own definitions, but the one I like to use is what I show here on the screen, which is simply an increase in the frequency of resistance, resistance alleles in a weed population after exposure to herbicide selection. And again, this really emphasizes the evolutionary implications or the fact that it's an evolutionary event. It's a change in genetics of a population due to selection. And so we can just give a little cartoon here just to get everybody on the same page. Here we have this imaginary weed population where these are individual weeds here. They have genes. In this case, this weed, I'm showing the ALS gene, and it has different alleles, one from the mother, one from its parent. And most plants have two copies of the normal wild-type sensitive ALS allele. But occasionally, in a non-selected population, very rarely, there will be an individual weed that has this rare resistance allele. So then when you spray the herbicide, it kills off the sensitive plants, the resistant plant, because it has that resistant allele, it survives, it transmits its alleles to the next generation, and this is what it looks like. Here's the initial population. After spraying, you can see an increase in that resistance allele. And in fact, we can quantify that. In this particular cartoon, it went from a frequency of 0.05 to 0.25. And the point here I want to make is that this is a very mathematical process. There are certain equations we can plug in that will predict and model evolution of herbicide selection and the resulting increase in, in resistance alleles how fast it happens and some of the details, some of the, the, the numbers that would punch into the equation are listed here below in terms of you know, how effective is the herbicide, what is the genetics of the resistance trait, what is the biology of the weed. All of those things would influence the equation, but the equations we know, they're mathematical, we can punch in the numbers and we can make very actually very good predictions. And so here's a, just a standard graph of resistance evolution. I plotted on the y-axis. You can think of this as the percentage of the plants in the field that are resistant over time. And this is the general shape of the curve. Now I have it showing here in this graph that about year seven it starts to take off or you start seeing resistance. It may not always be year seven. It might be year five or year nine. Again, that, if you go back to the previous slide, lots of factors can influence it. But this is the general shape. And when we look at this curve, there's really, we can divide it into two phases. There's this phase here where it looks like it's starting to recur, resistance is starting to occur in year seven, eight, nine, ten, it just takes off exponentially. And that phase we could describe as the management phase. Another term for that might be the reactive phase. You have resistance, you see it in your field, you're now starting to change your management to deal with that resistance problem. Prior to that phase, however, we could think of as the resistance mitigation phase. At this point, year one, two, three, you, it's not apparent that you have resistance in your field, and so you're trying to prevent resistance from happening. This is how we think about resistance, but I really want to change your way of thinking about this curve because I think there's a much more accurate way of thinking about it, and that's shown here. And so here's essentially the same data, but I've changed the y-axis and put it on a log scale. Okay. So we can put in the same time frame of these different phases. Here's year seven, where we just started seeing resistance in the previous graph, and that's the same thing here. So at year seven, the resistance frequency is 1%. So if you're getting 99% control, you're pretty happy, and you don't think you have resistance. And that's what's sh that's showing up in this curve. Prior to year seven, you're not seeing resistance. But if you look at this curve, what's happening? Year one, year two, resistance is increasing. And by the time you reach year seven, where are you on this curve? It's not the beginning of the problem. You're basically, this, this curve is played out. And so now you've, you're at the end of the process, essentially. And that's really how we need to think about resistance. And so we're not trying to prevent resistance early on. It's already there in the field. It's just at a frequency below what we can see. And so as we're dealing with our weeds in the field, we should always think that we are in the management phase. We have resistance in our field. We need to be preventing or trying to slow down the rate at which it's increasing. Okay, 
So that's a basic overview, and then when we get to this phase, as, as I say here, it's too late by the time you can see it. So you need to really be thinking about resistance, trying to manage and prevent resistance before you can see it. Once you see it, it's too late. And so this brings me to the, the specific uh, report or publication research project that we did. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how this project originated. And so back in 2006, we first confirmed glyphosate resistant water hemp in Illinois. And so at this location, this was a couple hours south of where I'm located here. As we drive back and forth, we did on-site uh, research at this location for a couple of years following its identification. And as glyphosate resistance was starting to expand from the single field and show up in other fields, and as, and as we were driving you know, to and from this research site and around the area, it was really remarkable how we would see in one field, it's pictured here in the upper left, a field that was a total mess, overrun by water hemp, presum presumably glyphosate resistant water hemp, but then maybe right across the road from that you would see a very clean field. And so this really begged the question, what's different between these two fields? Is there something the farmer is doing differently? Wouldn't it be great to know what is the single biggest difference between these two fields that we could use to understand why one field has glyphosate resistance and why the other field doesn't? And so that was really the origin of this study, is to try and ask this question, what is the factors, factors that are related to the presence or absence of glyphosate resistance? And so we took this landscape scale approach or an epidemiological approach to understand this question. Typically when you have a research question in science, you will, you will have a hypothesis, you will put out different treatments where you vary factors and then, then you look at the results. Well, in this study, we took a different approach. We already had the results. We had these fields that had or did not have glyphosate resistance. And so now we could ask the question, well, what were different about these fields? So we kind of went backwards. We had the result first, and then we asked what were the treatments that were imposed that got to those results. And so the way we did the study then is we, we went to a, a retail applicator uh, at, near, at this location, a person who sold herbicides, who actually in some cases applied the herbicides on these different farmers' fields. And we basically said over a, about a 700 square kilometer area, we say, can you give us about 100 fields, or identify 100 fields for us, about half that have a glyphosate resistant water hemp problem, about half that don't, and then we'll try and figure out what were the conditions that led to the resistance in those that had resistance and, and what apparently was, was responsible for not causing resistance in the other fields. And so we identified those fields, and we also had management records, or he was able to provide to us management records of those fields. And so we looked at various things, how, much, how often glyphosate was, was used, how often herbicides were rotated, how many herbicides were applied per year, whether a pre-emergence herbicide was, was used, basically anything we could find. We also looked at characteristics of the weeds in the field. For example, we, wanted, we, we assumed that the more water hemp you had in the seed bank, the more likely you were, have, you were to have glyphosate resistant water hemp. So we tallied that information. We looked at characteristics of the soil. We also looked at characteristics of the landscape. And if I can just skip ahead here, why would we look at the landscape? Well, so here's an example of a field which is surrounded by trees. So we, we would hypothesize that water hemp um, is an outcross species, and so maybe if the field is surrounded by trees, that would form a barrier to pollen, and so that would sort of protect this field from outside sources of pollen, and maybe this field would have a less chance of being resistant. We also know that water hemp seeds move in water, partly why it's named called water hemp. Um, and so we hypothesize that if you were a field that had a water course that might season, seasonally flood, that would be a source of water hemp seeds from maybe your neighbors or from other fields, and so therefore you might be more likely to get resistance. So again, kind of just casting a large net, collecting every factor we could think of that may in some way influence the outcome of resistance. So we collected all that data. In addition, we collected seed, brought that back to the greenhouse, and screened it for resistance. And so in this bottom right uh, photo here, I'm showing one field where there was a high level of glyphosate resistance, one field with a lower moderate level of resistance, and then over here is a field with no resistance. So we took this as our response variable, glyphosate resistance, and looked at all of these factors to see which one were associated with resistance. Some of the results, and I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but the first result I'll mention was that of all these factors we looked at, management, soil, landscape, weeds, management came out as being most associated. And that occurred 
regardless of what, whether we looked at the percent of the plants in the field that were resistant or simply looked at whether there was or was not glyphosate resistant water up in the field. Management factors were most important. And I actually take this as a very good finding. This means that you as a farmer are in control. I, I was a little bit surprised by this finding, to be honest. I thought, you know, if you had that water course running through your field or if you had a high water hemp seed bank density, you would probably be destined to get resistance regardless of what you did. These results said, no, that's not the case. What you do matters. And so, like I said, that's good news. That means you as a farmer are in control of the situation. If you do the right thing, you can delay resistance evolution. Okay, so management factors, management is most important. What, well, what aspect of management? And so we did this CART analysis, which is classification and regression trees. And I, I should have pointed out that I'm obviously not the only author on this study. There are several others and several very good statisticians who would probably love to explain the CART analysis in much more detail than I would care to explain. All I'm going to say is the CART analysis, it's basically a way to try to identify those factors that best explain the variance. And as we did this CART analysis, it pointed to herbicide use factors as being most important. And so that just set the stage that we really need to look at these herbicide use factors and how do they come into play. But the problem with this cart analysis is a, is a chicken and an egg problem or a, a cart before the horse problem. In other words, it implicated herbicide use factors, but we didn't know were the management factors caught influencing resistance or because we had records over time, maybe as resistance was starting to show up, farmers were changing their management. So which was causing which? And so we had this, this problem. And so the way we address this problem is our records went back to 2004, and resistance, glyphosate resistance, as I mentioned, was confirmed at this location in 2006. So we thought, well, let's look at management uh, practices in 2004 through 2006 before glyphosate resistance was known in the site and see, ask the question, could we look at the management practices that were in place in 2004 and 2006 to predict whether, there would be, whether or not there would be resistance in 2010? And so when we did that, the striking finding that came out was that herbicide mixing was very strongly associated with the practices that were, or I'm sorry, herbicide mixing that was in place in 2004 and 2000, through 2006 was very strongly associated with whether or not the farmer that, or that field would have resistance in 2010. And so these graphs are basically just showing different ways that we looked at. We looked at it in many different ways. The top here is the probability of resistance. The bottom is the proportion of the plants that were resistant. And again, the conclusion is the same regardless of how you look at it. Those farmers that were mixing herbicides or those fields that were receiving mixes of herbicides in 2004 and 2006 um, were less likely to see resistance in 2010. And so just to kind of quantify that, if, if a farmer on average was using two and a half herbicides per tank mix in 2004 through 2006, they were about 80% less likely to have glyphosate resistance in 2010. So, so these are the facts. These are the, these are, are the observations. I mean, this is sort of, we took all the data, took the, the glyphosate resistance test in 2010, we took all the factors, these are the results we got. So now the question is, well, why did we get these results? And so now I want to return back to sort of taking this evolutionary perspective and using evolutionary theory to explain why we got the results that we did. And so why is herbicide rotation not particularly effective? And I should back up and say, we're not the first people to conclude that herbicide mixing is better than herbicide rotation. I think, as I said at the beginning, what's nice about our study is it came from real fields managed by real farmers. Okay, and we came to this conclusion in a real world setting. So now, again, why, how, how do we explain these results based on the evolutionary underpinnings of resistance evolution? And so the reason why herbicide, resist, herbicide rotation is not particularly effective is because that in order to understand why it should be effective, you have to understand this idea of a fitness cost. So the basis for, for herbicide rotation to be an effective herbicide mitigation strategy is there's a cost of resistance, and this cost is a fitness cost in the absence of that herbicide. Okay, so what do I mean by this fitness cost? Well, a plant that is resistant to herbicide A is obviously at an advantage relative to its neighbor that doesn't have resistance to herbicide A when herbicide A is applied, right? The resistant plant will survive, its neighbor won't, okay? Well, it was generally assumed 
and actually demonstrated for some of our uh, for, for our very first case of herbicide resistance that a plant with resistance to herbicide A is actually at a disadvantage if herbicide A is not applied. And so if that's the case, and we thought that initially weed scientists thought that would be the case, then herbicide rotation makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, or on, on, unfortunately, however, it turns out that most of our herbicide resistance traits have very little fitness cost. And, and for, actually, they have basically a negligible, negligible fitness cost. So the whole premise for using herbicide rotation doesn't really work for most of our herbicide resistance traits. And I'll, I can demonstrate that to you graphically, or I'll try to demonstrate that to you. So this is the graph I showed you before. And so this is showing herbicide resistance evolution to herbicide A if herbicide A is used continuously. Okay. Now here I'm showing resistance to herbicide A. So this is resistance percentage. I should have noted this is resistance to herbicide A when this herbicide A is used in rotation with herbicide B. And so it looks like it's delaying resistance, and it is to an extent. But what we have to think about is we're only using herbicide A every other year. And so here I've, I've highlighted the use of herbicide A in brown. And so we can compare like number of applications of herbicide A. And so here's after two years of using herbicide A continuously versus two years in rotation. And then in theory, when we rotate away, because there's no fitness cost, that resistance frequency doesn't go down. It just stays the same. And then we come back and use herbicide A again. It jumps up again. We rotate it, stays the same. We use it again, it jumps up again. So the point I want to make, if you look up here at this eighth, after eight applications of using herbicide A continuously, we'd have 10% resistance under this scenario. If we use herbicide A in rotation every other year, after eight applications, we still have 10% resistance. So this graph really shows this idea that by rotating herbicides, you buy time because you can use it for more years but you're still using, only getting to use herbicide A eight times and you're at the same frequency. So herbicide rotation buys time, but it doesn't buy you applications. Whether you use herbicide A continuously or in rotation, you can use it about eight times if there's no fitness cost. Now, in, if our herbicide resistances did have a fitness cost, this blue curve shows you what it would be like. And this shows the effectiveness of herbicide rotation when you have a fitness cost. So here you use the herbicide A, it increases, you rotate away because there's a fitness cost, that fitness penalty works in your advantage and drives down the resistance. You use herbicide A, it comes up again, and then it gets driven down a little bit by that fitness cost. And so we can plot the like number of applications again, and you can see here now, if you used it eight times and continuously, you'd have 10% resistance, but in rotation, if there is a fitness cost, it's quite a ways down there yet. So in this scenario, which is actually being pretty generous in terms of the fitness penalty, it's buying you about three applications. So even if there is a herbicide fitness, or even if there's a fitness cost to resistance, it's buying you a few applications. Not a lot of applications, but it does buy you some. Th this fitness cost that I'm showing here in this blue curve, I believe I put that number at, at I think it was 50, uh, 25 or 50 percent fitness cost. I don't remember. So pretty high. That's about as high as we're going to see in most of our wheat. Even if, even with a high fitness penalty that I'm showing here, you're only gaining about three applications. But again, I just want to come back to this point. Whether it's 10 percent or 20 percent, it doesn't matter that much. It's going to buy you a few applications, but it's certainly not going to save that herbicide or, or prevent um, resistance from occurring to that herbicide. Why do we think from an evolutionary perspective is herbicide mixing, herbicide mixing effective? And this is a little more easier to explain, I think. And it simply comes down to the fact that the probability of a plant being resistant to two herbicides is the product of the probabilities of being resistant to each of the herbicide. And so you ask this question at the onset about what is the, this initial frequency of resistance? Well, if the initial frequency of resistance is about one in a million to herbicide A, and it's similar one in a million to herbicide B, the probability that a single plant will be sim simultaneously resistant to both herbicide A and B is equal to that product. So in this case, 10 to the minus 12th or one in a trillion. So you greatly decrease the chance that a plant is going to survive both herbicides and transmit its alleles to the next generation. This is assuming that you're going into a field where the resistance frequency of both is low.
okay? And, and so that brings me to this next slide. And so there's lots of caveats to this idea of why mixing is going to be effective. The first one I'll point out here on the slide is that in order for this to work, you have to have a different resistance mechanism being required for each herbicide. So if you have two herbicides that are both you know, ALS inhibitors, they both have ALS as the target site, and a single mutation can simultaneously confer resistance to both of those herbicides, then that's not going to be, it's not going to be 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 6. It's going to be simply 10 to the minus 6. Similarly, if the herbicides can be metabolized by the same enzyme, a single mechanism could overcome it, and so those two herbicides are not going to be an effective tank mix in terms of resistance mitigation strategy. Now, fortunately, we know the sites of action of our herbicides, and so we can make our selections based on herbicides with different sites of action. But unfortunately, we don't know the different enzymes that can metabolize our different herbicides. So the second point there, or the second sub-bullet, we're kind of left to have to guess at. The next big caveat, caveat is that the, the two herbicides that are used in the mix, they must be effective alone, and they must be targeting the same individuals. Okay, so some examples of what I mean by that or what doesn't constitute that or meet these, these criteria. If you're mixing a, a foliar active herbicide with a, a residual soil applied herbicide, those two herbicides are targeting different individuals on that field. And so that's not going to be an effective tank mix from a resistance management perspective. If the two herbicides aren't alone able to kill the weed, Okay, because they're being applied at a sublethal dose, then there again, you're not having an effective tank mix combination for a resistance management standpoint. I like to think of it as hammers, okay? Your herbicides are hammers, and each hammer alone has to kill that weed. If you're, if you're not having each hammer alone killing the weed, then, it can, then, then it's not going to be an effective tank mix strategy, okay? You mentioned just previously, Peter, that this 10 to the minus 6 assumes a non-selected population, and that's this other caveat here is if you already have a significant resistance population in that field, then mixing those two herbicides is not going to be effective from a resistance management strategy. Talking about pre-emergence herbicides, ideally, again, you want those herbicides to be targeting the same individuals. So if you mix two pre's, one which has a very short soil residual and the other has a very long soil residual, well, that one with the long soil residual is going to be targeting weeds by itself, and so you're not going to have two herbicides working together. And then, of course, the, the, the final point I'll make, which I think you guys drill into your farmers are quite well, is even the perfect mix is not bulletproof. In other words, herbicides themselves are not bulletproof. And we're, we've just been talking about herbicide management. That's one part of weed management. Ultimately, your, your weed management has to be more than just herbicides. It has to be lots of other diverse strategies as well. Take-home message is that the theory behind why mixing works, I think, is, is, is pretty obvious if you understand evolution. And, and you have to keep in mind these caveats. You, the idea is that each of these herbicides alone is killing the weed, and therefore you're reducing the likelihood that resistance alleles will be transmitted to the next generation.